Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm David Friedberg, and I'm director of the Italian Academy. And as some of you know, uh, I'd like to deny my administrative responsibilities by insisting that I'm uh, an art historian as well and uh, a professor in the department across the way, which typically is not. Do we have any members of my department here? See? There we are. <laughs> so much for cross-disciplinarity across the street. Um, welcome, everybody, this morning. It's wonderful to see you. Um, wonderful to see you all here this morning on the snowy day. I know that some of you had to make some difficult journeys, and uh, it's great that most of our speakers have arrived um, today. Unfortunately, it's as usual, the uh, Midwest is most uh, in the midst of the polar vortex, and last night, um, our keynote speaker, Marcus Rakel, the uh, father, so to speak, one of the fathers, I should say, rather, of the understanding of the default mode network, was both snowbound and voiceless in St. Louis. I think that sounds like a good title for a movie, Snowbound and Voiceless in St. Louis. And um, neither could Mar Maurizio Corbetta, who apparently had a voice because he could speak to me on the phone, unlike poor Marcus Rakel, who couldn't. Um, so, and uh, Maurizio Corbetta will not be here this morning either because he waited for four different planes, none of which eventually took off. So he finally gave up at midnight last night. At any rate, we stalwarts are here. It's not even a matter of being stalwarts because let me just say that this is one of our now quite well-known annual conferences in um, neurosciences that we think may be relevant to other disciplines that I think, and I think many of you think, are actually relevant to the understanding of all the disciplines in the world and under the, under the sun. Um, they've usually been uh, pioneering events. We had, uh, the first was on the uh, subject of attention, always a hot topic in our daily lives, and of course in neuroscience, organized by one of our postdoctoral fellows who is here today, at least they returned to the Italian Academy, Anna Ipata, it was a sold out event. We then had an extraordinary, I'm just uh, point to some of the highlights of which we think this will be a most worthy successor. We then had an extraordinary conference on new, new neuro techniques, which I first thought would not be a good idea. I thought it would be technic too technical for some of the more general members of the audience, but it kept the audience absolutely spellbound. And of course, those of us both in the fields of art and history, to say nothing of those of us <clears throat> in the medical and neuroscience fields itself, need to pay attention to every form of imaging and every possibility of imaging as it comes out um, as we move forward. Uh, my, uh, um, <clears throat> Carl Dyserot was one of the speakers on that occasion, and as you know, the possibilities of scanning were greatly expanded by his discoveries. Um, then, but I, it's odious, it would be odious to single out the many distinguished speakers we've had, all pioneers. And then last year, or our last conference was on the neuroscience of music, which I regret to say is one of those fields which has made a little more progress, I think, the understanding of Music, uh, music responses to music has made, the neuroscientific understanding of responses to music has made a little more progress, strangely enough, I think, than the uh, understanding of res the neural substrate of the understanding of responses to the visual arts. I'm not saying to images, of course, but I am saying to the understanding of <clears throat> the visual arts. I think today, I hope today, that the matter will at least be illuminated by our final speaker, Ed Vessel, um, who has been working, of course, on the relationship between DMN default mode, work, default mode network and, and resting state and responses to images. But I think even l last night's talk, our substitute talk, which I'll come to for Marcus Rakel, made it very clear, the, made very clear the possibilities for the understanding of creativity and aesthetics of the <coughs> default mode network. Even though I should say that Bill Kelly um, denied his focus, they denied that he was focusing on this area at all. So really the name of the game on these events, as I assured our first speaker today, Randy Buckner, was for those of you who are not familiar with basic neuroscientific principles, we like to think that you will 
open your minds and think hard. Um, and try to grasp some of the principles of the techniques and approaches and theories that will be proposed today. I just want to say something briefly about the Italian Academy in which you, in the theater of which you are now sitting. I, this is a, from a purely historical point of view, it's the last building built on the Columbia campus in the, uh, uh, by the studio of that great architect, Stanford White. It was a posthumous work, of course, because this was built in the 1920s, modeled, as you can see, on a kind of Renaissance palazzo, Renaissance Venetian palazzo. And when we don't have events like this, we have concerts. So those of you, concerts and occasionally performances, you can see that the palcoscenico, as we say, the stage is a little uh, narrow, not deep enough for uh, complex theatrical performances, but it will do for contemporary music. So please put yourselves on our mailing list. We will try to catch your emails, and those of you who are either in town or return to town um, are always welcome here. Um, I uh, <clears throat> also want to thank those people who've come from afar. We've had people traversing the country and traver traversing the ocean um, to present their papers at today's conference. I'm very grateful, I have to say, as I already suggested, to Bill Kelly, who stood in for Marcus Rakel. And those of you who are unable to be there will have missed an extraordinary survey of what DMN is and what its potential might be. I'm always slightly ashamed when scientists like Bill Kelly give um, uh, lectures such as his last night, introducing today's topic because I look around at my confrères in the fields of English literature, the fields of is history, those people who are supposed to know about the powers of rhetoric. And then I listen to scientists who are not supposed to have had any training in rhetoric, and yet the presentations are always clear, witty, and amazingly not dependent on reading texts before them. So, you know, I think you're going to get the point today, and if you don't, um, then just try harder. Um, we are very <laughs> proud here, we are very proud here of what I call the sort of cross-disciplinary um, uh, postdoctoral program. We've now had more than 200 people, 200 postdocs from all over the world, and the idea of our meetings here, both meetings such as these and our weekly seminars, is not so much to turn neuroscientists, as I was saying last night, into humanists or humanists into scientists of any stripe, but for people to listen, to try to get a grasp of what the other what the basic principles of other paradigms <coughs> might be. And I think today, <coughs> which after all deals with another cutting edge topic, um, today will be a good test of that. I'm glad to see some of our fellows here today. Um, now, an event like this, I want to get straight to the point, we've got a number of speakers uh, this morning, you want to hear them, not me, but I just want to say this, an event such as the one we have today wouldn't be possible without the work, as you can imagine, of a large number of people. Uh, I'm especially grateful to my own staff here at the Academy, and above all, Abigail Asher, who has not only put this whole event together almost single-handed, not only won the uh, speakers over, because you will see we have the most distinguished speakers in the field, and this is all because of the charm of the letters of Abigail. Not only that, she's also had to, de to deal with the irritability of a director who is doing far too much, and so she has overcome this, and you, if you have any issues today, Abigail is standing there. She will gracefully deal with all of them, not me. And can we just give Abigail a round of applause for everything that she's done? This is not to exclude my other staff members, but they will have their uh, appreciations expressed um, on other occasions. And then, above all, I want to thank our colleagues at NYU. This is really a joint uh, conference. Um, it wouldn't really have come about, this particular topic, had it not been for conversation which Ed Vessel and I had about a year ago in which realizing that both of us were interested in neuroscience and the possibilities of understanding better the neural substrates of responses to art, uh, we actually had a sort of a fight, I suppose, because 
you know, I had written a little about motor responses to images, empathic responses to images. I hadn't really bothered too much about distinguishing between responses to everyday images and responses to artistic images, because as you know, most art historians are not really worried about the definition of what art or isn't thinking that that notion is beyond the reach of human understanding. And there I was having this argument with Ed Vest, and he said, no, 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 it's not beyond the reach of human understanding. Um, DMN can help us understand the quality of our reflections about art. Uh, you know you'll think I'm producing this conversation, but for the purposes of the, <laughs> the purposes of this introduction, we had this kind of argument. We got into uh, a discussion about mind wandering. We got into a discussion about, you know, um, how one acquires a sense of the self, what happens in the brain when you are aware of the self. And, you know, so our conversation proceeded along the lines of the newest findings in the field of the default mode network. Now, you will hear from other speakers this morning who will talk about other aspects of the default mode network. I think most of our speakers are less involved with the aesthetic questions, with questions of creativity, than all sorts of other uh, aspects of this resting state and of the default mode which uh, Bill distinguished very nicely between last night, but you will piece this together this morning. But this would not have happened had it not been for Ed's insistence on the relevance of this topic and for the immediate support of the Dean of, um, uh, the Cheryl Kushner, Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, to give her full title, uh, Gabrielle Starr. Gabby, we all call her. And Gabby um, is not only Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at NYU, um, which of course meant that she actually had some resources to contribute to bringing you together and helping entertain you. So we are at least as grateful to uh, Gabby as to all our senior administrative figures at Columbia. But of course she is neither, not only an administrator, she's also a professor of English, and she has actually just produced a book, it's fresh, or relatively fresh and new. She was cross with me this morning when I said it was sitting on my desk and I hadn't read it, because in fact she knows perfectly well that the topic of the book and the title of the book, Feeling Beauty, it's out there, you can go out and buy it, it's MIT, right? Um, this is a subject which is, of which is of interest to all of us who are not, not only those of us interested in default mode network, but all of us, these are art historians as well, who are interested in embodied responses to whatever we might decide is beautiful. So I recommend that book. It's an engaging, it seems to be an engaging read. I've just looked at the beginnings, but go out there, buy the book. And, but the point of this whole introduction is really to thank Gabby for making this possible, um, helping make this possible, to thank Ed for having proposed it, and then to thank my colleagues at Columbia for getting all of this in motion. So welcome to this conference. Enjoy yourselves. I'm not going to end quite yet um, because I want to give the word to Gabby. She will want to say something as well. Thank you so much, Gabby. So I'll be very brief. That was really a generous introduction um, to both the conference and, and for me. And, and, you know, a great plug for my book. It's on Amazon, um, $20.13. Thir um, I just want to say a few things quickly. It's lovely to be doing a joint venture with Columbia because very rarely do we get to go up and downtown. Uh, so it's a nice, uh, nice thing to uh, join together. Um, the, Italian Academy is a particularly wonderful space in which to do this because it uh, has a history of collaboration uh, that goes across not just disciplines but internationally. Uh, and I think what is most true about the research that you'll hear today is that it's all been produced through extraordinary collaborative efforts. And you'll see this is one of the lovely things about hearing talks from scientists is that they always have that wonderful moment when the curtain goes up or goes down and the credits start to roll. Um, and I think one of the things that I hope happens today is some and productive argument across disciplines so that we can understand that creating interdisciplinary, truly interdisciplinary teams does not rely on the expertise of any individual, but on the ability to connect different kinds of expertise that come from different places. And I hope we'll be able to do that today. Um, again, thank you to David and to Ed and Abigail. Uh, and I'm so proud to be able to, to be here and to help bring together such extraordinary scholars. Um, 
I will also say that that the collaboration that starts here will be continued uh, with some Ed and, and David and I and other individuals in a, a three-year undertaking to create a programmatic view of how we can uh, understand aesthetics across music, painting, and poetry. And I think by the end of today, you'll begin to see some of the ways in which the, the research that we hear today actually feeds quite interestingly and powerfully into questions about uh, aesthetic experience. So thank you. Let's get ready to argue. Let's get ready to rumble. Um, and. I'm back simply to introduce this morning's moderator. I'm incredibly grateful to my dear colleague Kevin Oxnow, who is professor in the Department of Psychology here at Columbia. But as so often the psychologists are engaged with neuroscience and have been engaged with neuroscience every bit as intensely as those who fall officially under that umbrella, most of whom are now still uptown and shortly will be here. Um, next to Fairway on 125th and between 125th and 135th Street. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Kevin, who will moderate this morning's discussion, despite the fact that he too is, uh, has been smitten with the flu. Now, I've known Kevin for a long time. When I brought speakers here to talk about mirror neurons, Kevin was the great mirror skeptic, and we had some vigorous engagements over over mirror neurons over here, um, which were some of the most exciting discussions because they were vivid, open, frank, um, took place in this room. And then we had a whole discussion about fear responses, which is sort of more in line with him, but not his major topic of research. As you know, he's the great expert on emotional responses. Fear, of course, comes into it, and the amygdala always comes into emotions. But as you know, we also have a colleague, colleagues up here who work on other aspects of emotions, as you do down at NYU. And um, he monitored a number, moderated a number of equally vigorous and sometimes frightening discussions about the role of the amygdala in um, response and emotional response and fear responses in particular. But, you know, I knew Kevin right from the outset because, because of my own interest in basic emotional responses. And, of course, Kevin is a person who worries about this particular adjective, as do my colleagues. You know, what is a basic emotional response? Because he's the guy who really has done his work on the appraisal of emotions in prefrontal cortex. You all know his fundamental articles on the topic of prefrontal modulations of uh, lower level emotional responses. He's one of the people who has chased away that adjective limbic from the discussion of emotions. And, you know, he's really for a long time used fMRI to ask what mechanisms underlie our ability to change the way we feel by changing the way we think about the meaning of our experiences. So I thought that he is somebody who could really slightly from the outside be the best possible moderator of um, this morning's discussion. So it's my great pleasure to have Kevin here. Thank you, Kevin. I'm going to turn the morning's proceedings over to you. Welcome. <laughs> 